welcome back to the shop. This time around, I'm gonna share with you something that I originally hadn't planned on doing, and that is finishing up the construction of the top enclosure for my 3D printer. Um, so back around Christmas time, I designed the enclosure, and then my father machined it out for me graciously on his CNC router. So this is quarter inch thick polycarbonate. As you can see here, there's some vent holes, and then these are the individual screw holes for mounting it to this extrusion, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and I have to say, for a router, the, the surface finish is excellent. I know you can't see it on camera, but it's, it's very good in my opinion. Um, so I have several pieces that are, all have to get rigidly secured together. And the way you do that is take this, in this case, this is 15 millimeter square extrusion, put it down here, um, screws through from the other side to nuts that run in the track. And then you can hold the extrusion together end to end with these corner blocks which requires you to tap a hole in the end of it. And then basically the way these are designed, let me get this work in order like that. You put a screw through there. You could put a screw through the back and one through here and you could basically make the corner of a box. But I don't have enough hands to, to show you all that. So what I need to do is go over to the mill. I need to machine all these to length because they're just um, cleaned up on one end. And then I have to measure them. And since these are larger, the most, um, your standard um, calipers. I bought these as a Christmas present to myself. These are 24 inch Starrett veneer calipers. Uh, I was very pleased with these. They were, they're old, but they're in excellent condition. So, and I've had to do a little practicing because it's actually quite a bit harder to use this than it is uh, your standard dial or um, digital indicator. So um, let me switch the cameras over to the mill and I'll show you what we got going on. Okay. I've got everything back over here at the mill that I need. And since this is a non-trivial setup, I'll walk you through it. So the first thing is, since I have several of these to do, I have, I don't know if you can see them, probably not. I have several little springs like this. I have a whole bag of them down here inside the vise holding the um, parallels apart so I don't have to mess with them. Um, so I guess I'll put this down here. This is the longest one. These were all five millimeters long from the manufacturer. So let's just stick out a half an inch, which should be a little less than half an inch. Let's do like three eighths to half an inch. Um, let's clamp it down gently. And this is um, one of the first things I want to mention. Um, can you see that? Yeah. So this is, there's not a whole lot here. You can see just this little webbing here, that little webbing there. So if you crank down on this, you will deform it and bend it and you will not be happy. So first thing you want to do is with a material like this is gently do some light clamping, look at it, maybe do a couple test cuts, figure out how much clamping you actually need. Now over here at this end, this technically probably isn't needed. Definitely not for the um, short ones, but for this one, these couple long ones that I have, this is for sure needed. Because when I did the first couple test cuts down here, you could just see the end wiggle. So this is just your standard toe clamp. Clamp down on a machinist jack. And then we're not actually using it for any support. So once I get the nut started, finger tight is more than good enough because all we want to do is just keep it from um, wobbling out here in the wind. That should be cleaned up. Now I can go grab the calipers and see how much more I got to take off. Okay, I've measured this twice already. I'm gonna take one more measurement just to double check because I am not very good with these. What I'm trying to do here, since this is a giant lever arm and your little, um, fine feet over here, you can easily bow it. 
by a few thousands. So I'm just trying to line everything up and get it close and apply just a little bit of tension. Yeah, okay. So I've measured it three times and got the same measurement three times, so I think that's good enough. Okay, that was 50 thousandths with each pass. Um, since I do have this clamped lightly, I don't want to try and hog it all off at once. I don't want the part to move. But I have to tell you one thing. I'm not sure what grade of aluminum this is, but it machines beautifully. There's no burrs or anything. Let me get the calipers and measure it again. Okay, I've uh, done a final check before the finishing passes. And we have five thousandths to take off. So I'm going to put a little cutting fluid on here. I'm going to take, let's say, two and a half uh, conventional mill cut, and then we'll do two and a half in the reverse on a climb. Oh, didn't want to do that. That's it. This one's done. So I won't bore you. I'll do the other nine or 10 that I have to do off camera. And then I'll bring you back when it's time to tap the ends. It's been about a week since I filmed the last segment. And as you might be able to guess, part of it is down to the fact that I caught a sinus infection, hence my horrendous sounding voice. But that's actually not the main reason. The main reason is because the tap in front of you isn't the one I started the project with. That one is. That's an M3 by 0.5 spiral flute tap. Um, the only difference between the two is the new one is actually a bright finish. The other one was a black oxide. I've used this tap for uh, more projects than I can think of because I do several things that require M3. Um, and I've used a similar setup many times. And it didn't even break while, actually while tapping. It broke while I was reversing the tap out of the threaded hole. And I was substantially far back out and just like that, like nothing, just my fingertips just snapped for some reason. So I'll take you over to the um, drill press here in a minute because that's where I'm doing this. And I'll show you the setup I'm using and why I'm using it. So I got the cameras repositioned. So as you can see here, what I've got is um, the table on my drill press turned vertically and then everything aligned so that I can get my hands out of the way. You can probably see I can drill down through the edge. Uh, Sorry, that's kind of squeaky and loud, but um, drill down through the end of the extrusion. Now I have to do this at my drill press because the longer pieces of extrusion are too long to do on my mill, even if I had proper work holding and I don't have the proper work holding tools to hold a piece of extrusion that's nearly 20 inches long um, and this flimsy so I can drill it. But um, this is more than adequate. So let me <clears throat> get started here. So the first thing I gotta do is I'm just gonna run a drill down through it. I can't remember if I mentioned before or not, but this is technically already, um, the hole in here is already supposed to technically be the size for M3, but 
I'm running a drill down through it just in case. Just a little tap magic. That should be more than good enough. And if you're wondering why my table or my drill press is moving around, it's because it's on um, wheels so that I can move it if I need be. It's It's more than rigid enough for the task that I needed to do, but when you're playing with a chuck or something, it wobbles. Um, okay, so the tap, just apply a little bit more tap magic. And since this is a spiral flute tap, I don't really need to back it off to break chips. I should be able to, and I, as I have done countless times before, just run it down to the depth needed and then reverse it out. As you can see, the chip's spiraling up out right now. I mean, there's no tension, there's no grittiness feeling, so it should all just work fine. That's more than enough, so just back it back out. And this is what I was doing last time, just backing it out. Right about here, it just snapped off which, as you might imagine, involved some words that can't be played on YouTube. Almost out of here. So there, I'm out. So <clears throat> that's it for this one. This is relatively boring, so I'll finish these rest of them off camera, and I'll bring you back when I'm to the final part of assembling the um, enclosure. Mm. Okay, so I've got everything cleaned up. Um, this is fairly straightforward. So this is the top of the enclosure for the printer. Um, back, front, sides, and top. This is a upper access hatch. Eventually there'll be a handle here, these two holes here, and then there'll be hinges back here across the top. So when you wanna access the top of the printer, you'll just be able to lift it up. And then the way I've designed the hinges, they are using dowel pins so that when you rotate it up, you can slide it off if you want. The only other part that I didn't show was the door. This is on the front of the main printer. Same thing, hinges and then a handle. The hand, this will be held in place with magnets. The top will obviously be held in place with um, gravity. <clears throat> it's fairly straightforward and took way longer than I thought it would be would to get it done, but it's done now. But I'm still not done with my printer upgrades. I have to um, order an accelerometer because I'm going to do some uh, resonance tuning on my machine. But then I hopefully in the next month or so, I hopefully to get, hope to get this on it, and printer everything all back to normal after my um, operating system change. And then I can be back to printing things as I need them. So I hope you found this if informative. If you didn't find it informative, informative, hopefully you at least found it entertaining, especially with my, my horrendous voice right now. Thank you.